Good day, students. Professor Pontificate here. Your course instructor, Professor Matt, asks that I speak to you today about another basic element of argument, warrants. Such a kind man, his request I could not deny. Now, you may recall from my previous lectures that we can classify claims into three varieties, claims of fact, value, and policy, and support into logos, ethos, and pathos. Today, I will define a third category of argument, warrants, and outline three different types. All claims are grounded in warrants, which are assumptions that the audience must share with the writer if the claim is to prove acceptable. Warrants are general, hypothetical statements which act as bridges and entitle one to draw conclusions or make claims. In essence, warrants bridge the gap between the claim and the support. Warrants are similar to guiding principles that shape beliefs and actions, and can be founded on a variety of things such as our life experience, our culture, and our personal observations. We are capable of analyzing warrants, however, warrants often go unexpressed in arguments. Thus, they can be more difficult to discern than claims and support, which are on the surface of an argument. Unexpressed warrants require a bit of detective work. Let's consider an example. Suppose one makes a claim that our society is desensitized to violence. As support for their claim, the arguer may say, well, I am desensitized to violence in the media. In this example, the warrant or the assumption that connects the claim and the support is that the arguer represents society. The I must substitute for society if the claim is to be validated according to the support proffered. Of course, the canny observer will ask if this warrant is valid, and I would contend that it all depends upon the backing for the warrant. Did the arguer demonstrate that he or she is a good representation of society? Were other examples brandished? Even better, were research studies cited? If not, the audience may deduce that the arguer has reached a hasty generalization, that is, a conclusion that has not been sufficiently proven with evidence. We can think about warrants in three broad categories, the first of which are authoritative warrants. The authoritative warrant is based on the credibility or trustworthiness of the source. A cunning audience will ask of the authoritative warrant whether the authorities cited in the argument are sufficiently respected to make credible claims. They may also want to know if equally reputable authorities disagree. Humans are, of course, notoriously fickle creatures. Thus, no subject is likely to receive 100% agreement. However, generally, what we are looking for is consensus among the experts in a field. There will always be naysayers, rogue outliers, and conspiracy theorists. While oftentimes we may not have the patience for suffering fools, we should also recognize that occasionally the outliers can teach us things. However, for the most part, we should default to consensus among experts. The second category of warrants are substantive. Substantive warrants examine the reliability of the evidence given to support a claim. Important questions to ask of the substantive warrant include, are sufficient examples given? Are the examples representative? Does the cause give account entirely for the effect? If comparisons are made, are similarities greater than differences? If we can answer in the affirmative to these questions, then our arguer has adequately backed his or her warrant. On the contrary, if we answer in the negative, then the arguer has not properly backed the substantive warrant. Consider our earlier argument about society being desensitized to violence. If the arguer simply relies on him or herself as a sole example to prove all society is desensitized, I would hazard a guess that many would not find one example compelling and too easy to dismiss. Thus, we might conclude that this arguer has not adequately backed his substantive warrant. The third and final category of warrants are motivational warrants. The motivational warrant is based on the needs and the values of the audience, as they are relevant to the claims being made. In the motivational warrant, we need to consider if the values the arguer appeals to are ones the audience will regard as important. We should also ascertain whether these values are relevant to the claim. We know that many fact claims are nested in value claims, and these values may be implied or unexpressed. Let's further consider our example of society in desensitization to violence. Now, this claim is stated as one of fact. However, we may be able to extract a nested value in this claim, that it is good for society to be sensitive to violence, or that violence is bad. Consider, for the sake of argument, a barbarian society built around pillaging and plundering. Such a society would value violence as a good, not an evil. Sensitization to violence would not be privileged in such a society because it is not an inherent value. Since this is not a shared value between the arguer and the audience in this case, the audience would likely reject the claim on the basis of the motivational warrant. So, as you can see, it is important that the arguer considers the needs and values of the audience in making effective claims. 
I will now offer definitions to complete our final three terms for studying argument. The first is backing. Backing is the evidence given in order for the audience to accept the warrant underlying the support that in turn will validate the claim. To illustrate, when a writer introduces his or her sources to the audience and gives brief descriptions of their credentials, this helps to back the authoritative warrant. In a recent study by the Center for Disease Control, or according to a Harvard scholar so-and-so, these are signal phrases that help build support for evidence given and work to validate the authoritative warrant. One way to back the substantive warrant is to offer statistics that lend logical weight to anecdotes used. It would be good for the arguer in our example to engage in such a move. Next is the rebuttal, which examines counterarguments, counterexamples, or exceptions to the claim. The rebuttal acknowledges that there is more than one side to the debate and admits existence of conflicting evidence. Had our arguer in this example brought to bear examples of people who are not desensitized to violence, then this would constitute counterexamples. Perhaps not all of society is desensitized to violence. The rebuttal may lead to our final element of argument, the qualification. Qualifications are limits to the claim that are typically based on counterexamples or different definition. In our example, the arguer may examine examples of people who are not desensitized to violence, and as a consequence, limit their claim to say a certain percentage of people in society are desensitized. So we may have gone from our whole society being desensitized to let's say 50% of people in society who are desensitized to violence. This would constitute a qualification to the claim. This is Professor Pontificate signing off until next time. Meanwhile, do not bother me with your questions as I will be engaged in the life of the mind. Instead, consult your course instructor, Professor Matt, a most benevolent human being.